country. More than one in five Canadians lives with a disability. And today, with the pandemic straining a number of social safety nets, including health care, employment services and social supports, Canadians with disabilities say they're being left doubly disadvantaged. For more on the issues in this election, joining us this morning is lawyer and disability advocate David Lepofsky and accessibility specialist Thea Curdy. Thank you both for being here today. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Uh, David, let's start with you. Uh, in a recent article for Toronto Metro, you said Canadians with disabilities are being left out of pandemic emergency planning at all levels of government. Um, why do you feel that way? Well, the federal government uh, did a one-time only payment to people with disabilities uh, last year, but took months just to get the checks sent out after they announced it. Provincial level, well, here in Ontario, our hospitals are all trained up if they're overloaded with patients, and that could happen again, uh, to triage those needing critical care on criteria that could include holding against a person their disability. Uh, and that's something happening at least in, uh, uh, on the books, at least in Quebec as well. We hope it never happens. So, so we've disproportionately suffered the consequences of the pandemic and disproportionately been left out of the proper planning for uh, urgent needs during the pandemic. Thea, in a recent post on LinkedIn, you said this election, party leaders need to listen to the concerns of disabled Canadians. Um, what are some of those concerns? Well, I can tell you, having worked for 20 years in the built environment sphere of accessibility and universal design, that we are tragically having a good bad news story, at least in the built environment. Um, the good news is we know how to fix what's wrong, but the bad news, which has three parts, is much worse than non-disabled people suspect, and the approach is still all backwards and biased. So first, our National Building Code and post-secondary design education still treat accessibility as an afterthought instead of aligning with our international commitments to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and our 40-year-old legislation, you know, the Canadian Charter and the Human Rights Codes. Uh, two, what little there is is really only for wheelchair access, not the 70% of disabilities like mine who are invisible. And three, they shockingly still exempt housing and don't include how to make workplaces accessible, not only sabotaging our affordable housing and aging place goals, but also our employment strategies and our diversity and inclusion, sustainability and wellness policies. David, anything to add? Do you have any uh, other concerns heading into the election? Well, two years ago, the, the federal uh, parliament unanimously passed the Accessible Canada Act, but it was weak in many ways. We've written all the parties to ask them if they will agree to strengthen it and offer 12 ways to, to make things better. The only party that's answered us uh, at all, uh, much less making most of the commitments, many if not most of the commitments we sought, are the NDP. We're not partisan. We want to get all the party leaders to make those commitments. So as I'm sitting here 12 days before the election, I look at the two parties that are leading in the polls. Again, we're not partisan. We're not trying to elect anybody, but we say, uh, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. O'Toole, will you please make the commitments now that uh, we need to make sure that legislation is made strong, not weak, and that it's effectively implemented. The case of Mr. O'Toole, he, his party promised during debates over that bill that if the if the government didn't strengthen it, if the Trudeau government didn't strengthen it, that his party would. We'd like him to, to stand behind that pledge now and, uh, and tell voters uh, with disabilities that if he's elected, he'll do that. And that's for Mr. Trudeau. He promised an ambitious uh, implementation of the act uh, two years ago, but they've been dragging their feet ever since. And, and uh, in this election, we'd like to uh, see him do better than that vague promise that we've already seen broken. Uh, Thea, I want to go back to something that you said, because you know, many disabilities, as you said, are invisible like your own. Um, trying to wrap my head around it, what's the best way for government to support people with non-obvious disabilities? I mean, if we can't see it, how can we, um, how can we be an ally? Well, as I was saying, we've known for 20 years, at least for the built environment, and that's not the only aspect for accessibility, as David constantly talks about and, and I support. Uh, 
if you're thinking about disability and the international symbol of disability is a person in a wheelchair, uh, naturally, you're not thinking about people who are autistic, have environmental sensitivities, have dementia. We know how to fix those things. We've got really good, robust uh, standards that have been developed over the last 20 years that consulted with people with a lived experience that used evidence-based design and research. So how do we create environments that are not toxic, uh, that are actually accommodating to people who are blind, deafblind, uh, or uh, even the older population who have a multitude or an intersection of disabilities like hearing loss and vision loss and arthritis and bad backs. So there's, uh, it's good news because we can fix it. We just have to fix our legislation so that we can actually get there. I want to thank you both for joining us today. These are important conversations to have and uh, during an election campaign, all the more important. So thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts today. Thanks so much.